hello again to everyone and welcome to our webinar series on children's pain. This has been brought to you uh, over the last year or so uh, through a partnership between the CIHR team in children's pain and CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And it's all been funded through uh, a grant from the Canadian Institute for Health Research. Uh, this is the fourth installment in this series, and all previous episodes have been recorded and are posted on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network, which you can find at www.ken.cafc.org. Uh, and there is a section on children's pain there. You can also use the search box to search for pain or other um, keywords related to pain. Or there's also a tag cloud on the front page, which will allow you to find information related to this topic. Uh, we have some great speakers today uh, joining us. From, uh, from their offices in Toronto at the Hospital for Sick Children. Um, our first uh, presenter is going to be, I believe it'll be uh, Kimberly Widger, who uh, began her PhD studies in September of 2006 at the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing uh, at the University of Toronto. Um, prior to that, she was a clinical nurse specialist with the Pediatric Palliative Care Service at the IWK Health Center and an adjunct adjunct professor at the Dalhousie University School of, of Nursing in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She's a member of the Canadian Nurses Association uh, Hospice Palliative Care Nursing Exam Committee and is on the executive of the Canadian Network of Palliative Care for Children. Kimberly's doctor, doctoral research is a multi-center study to develop and test an instrument to measure the quality of care provided to dying children and their families from the perspective of bereaved mothers. Uh, following Kimberly will be Maria Rugg, who graduated from the University of Windsor with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing with honors in 1990. She obtained her Master's of Nursing Science, Acute Care Nurse Practitioner in Pediatrics from the University of Toronto in 2001, and she also achieved a national certification for Hospice Palliative Care Nurse in Canada in two, uh, 2004 and 2009. Uh, she has worked at the Hospital for Sick Children for the past 20 years as an advanced practice nurse for Pediatric Palliative and Bereavement care service at SickKids. Uh, she began work in 94 as the palliative care coordinator at SickKids and within this role has led many initiatives including end-of-life care policy development on a national level, bereavement and palliative care standards, and palliative care program planning, development, and research. And following uh, Maria is Maru Barrera uh, and she has been the uh, pediatric, she's a pediatric health psychologist with research and clinical interests in the field of pediatric cancer for over 10 years. She's an associate scientist in, pop, in the Population Health Sciences Program at the Hospital for Sick Children's Research Institute. And along with her clinical and research commitments, she holds academic appointments at the University of Toronto as the, uh, associate, at the associate professor level in the departments of Population Health Sciences, the Fac Faculty of Medicine, Department of Human Development and, and Applied Psychology, Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, and Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, most of her clinical research, clinic, clinical and research work is conducted in the hematology and oncology uh, program at the uh, Hospital for Sick Kids. So I'm just, uh, without uh, any uh, further ado, I'm going to hand this over to our folks in Toronto and uh, allow them to start the presentation. So uh, over to you, uh, uh, Kimberly, I believe. All right, thanks, Doug. We'll just pull this up. All right, so thanks very much for having us today to talk about an area that's very near and dear to our hearts, and thank you to everyone out there for taking time to participate in this webinar with us today. This is a new format for all of us, so we're excited to give thanks. Um, the first one was from Pokes to Post. Up. The second one was reducing pain in infants and young children during pokes and other procedures. And the third one was kids get chronic pain too, assessment and management of pediatric chronic pain. And the uh, recordings of all those are available on the website that you see. So today the presentation is called Alleviating Pain and Suffering in Pediatric Palliative Care, a Multidisciplinary Approach. Uh, and as Doug said, uh, the presenters are myself and Maria Rugg and Maru Barrera. And just to give the official disclaimer statement, uh, none of us have any financial relationships to disclose or conflicts of interest. And the CIHR team in children's pain and translating research on pain in children are both funded by CIHR. 
So our objectives for today, uh, we hope that after this session you will be able to define pediatric palliative care, identify children who may benefit from pediatric palliative care, identify the common types, prevalence, and impact of pain in pediatric palliative care, identify the principles of pain assessment and management for children with life-limiting illness, uh, identify myths and misconceptions about pain management for children with life-limiting illness, describe the psychological impact of disease and treatment on children, uh, identify methods to prevent or reduce psychological suffering in children with life-limiting illness and their families. And we've divided the presentation up into basically three parts. So I'm going to give you a bit of the background and uh, kind of set the stage for the other two, talking about pain and suffering uh, in pediatric palliative care. Then Maria will focus more on the physical pain and suffering. And finally, Maru will talk about more the psychological pain and suffering for the child and family. So to get started with a little bit of the background, we're actually going to start with a poll question. So when should palliative care begin? At diagnosis of a life-limiting illness, about three months before the death, about two years before the death, or when curative treatments end? And I'll turn it over to Doug to run the poll. So there's, uh, there's your results. 84% for at the diagnosis of life-limiting illness. 5% said about three months before death. No one said about two years before death, and 11% said when curative treatment ends. Okay, great. So we'll continue on and hopefully get um, talk about actually each of those options and how they fit into pediatric palliative care. So what is pediatric palliative care? Well, this picture gives sort of the traditional view, and this is really based on uh, more adult cancer care rather than children's pediatric palliative care, with the idea that curative care happens and then at some point everybody decides that that's not working and we have a short period of palliative care, the PC there, and then the child dies and moving on into bereavement. However, if you wait till everybody gets to that point where you say, yes, now we're done with the curative stuff, will move on, uh, then you only get the good stuff of palliative care for the last days or maybe even the last hours of life. So that doesn't work so great. A different way of thinking about pediatric palliative care looks more like this model, where curative care and palliative care are offered together right from diagnosis throughout the illness. And to some degree, that line in between curative and palliative can be a very gray line and very up and down rather than a straight line. So at times, there may be more focus on treatments that are aimed at curing a child's illness, if there are treatments available. And at other times, it may be more focused on treatments um, to palliate the uh, illness that the child has. In terms of a definition, there's lots out there. Um, one of the ones I like the best is from the Association for Children with Life-Threatening or Terminal Conditions and Their Families in the UK. And that says, palliative care for children and young people with life-limiting conditions is an active and total approach to care from the point of diagnosis or recognition, embracing physical, emotional, social, and spiritual elements through to death and beyond. It focuses on enhancement of quality of life for the child or young person and support for the family and includes management of distressing symptoms, provision of short breaks, and care through death and bereavement. So based on the, the second model there and of course the definition you just heard, we do say that palliative care should begin at diagnosis rather than waiting until all curative treatments have been exhausted. And some places do ha actually have the capacity to have referrals made to a pediatric palliative care team at diagnosis um, for every child that, that could benefit. Uh, but in other places, probably the team would be completely overwhelmed if they actually received uh, all the referrals. So, so in some places, they do use the criteria of the two years. So saying, uh, if you would not be surprised if this child died in the next two years, that's the time maybe to make a referral to palliative care. And in some places, there's additional funding or benefits available for the last three months of life. So all of the pieces that were in the poll question actually 
um, may in some situations have some bearing uh, in terms of more when referrals are made to a palliative care team. But whether or not a referral is made, the principles of palliative care should start at diagnosis. And in our presentation today, we're very much talking about the big picture of palliative care as being starting at diagnosis. So what kinds of illnesses are we talking about then? This as well comes from the uh, Association for Children with Life Threatening or Terminal Conditions in Their Families. And it's sort of four categories of illnesses. Um, the first being, or quadrants, the first being that illnesses where the child could be cured, but there is a possibility of death. And those would be illnesses like cancer or irreversible organ failure, um, like failure of the heart, liver, or kidney. So a transplant may be curative for the child, but if you can't get a transplant, then the child may in fact die from their illness. And I've got experience with families who say they, they are palliative care graduates when they get uh, some kind of treatment that, that is more curative, uh, and they go to palliative care and back in this category. In quadrant two, these are conditions where premature death is inevitable, but it may not be until adulthood, particularly with diseases like cystic fibrosis now. Um, the length of life is certainly uh, extending as new treatments are found. But there's long periods of intensive treatment aimed at prolonging life and allowing participation in normal, uh, typical activities for the child. In category three, there's a wide variety of progressive conditions that have no curative treatment options. Treatment is exclusively palliative right from diagnosis, and it generally extends over many years. And this would be diseases like Batten's disease, mucopolysaccharidoses, and a wide variety of other neurodegenerative and metabolic diseases. In quadrant four, these are illnesses where they are reversible, non-progressive conditions, but they cause severe disabilities and susceptibility to health complications, and those are the things that um, increase the likelihood of premature death. So some examples would be severe cerebral palsy, multiple disabilities following a brain or spinal cord injury, and there's a lot of complex health needs and a high risk of unpredictable life-threatening events or episodes. So for the remainder of our presentation today, we're talking about palliative care starting at diagnosis, and we're thinking about children with illnesses that may fall into any of these categories, and we'll be referring to those as life-limiting illnesses. So now on to the pain piece. So from, for some illnesses, the time from diagnosis to death can be uh, quite a number of years, and of course lots of things can happen in that time. Like my buddy Daniel here in front of his tree of finger puppets, and this was a very, very small part of Daniel's collection of finger puppets. He got one with every poke he had related to treatment of neuroblastoma. And this picture was actually taken in celebration of his last poke for the first wave of his treatment. And unfortunately, he did relapse and had many, many more pokes after this. Um, but it gives you an idea of the, the uh, number of pokes this young man received. So the types of pain experienced by children that fall into the categories that I um, described before are really the same as what you've heard about in previous webinar presentations. Children with cancer may have pain as well, though, due to the cancer itself. So the tumor growing into or compressing bones, soft tissues, nerves, that kind of pain is present at diagnosis, but it hopefully is going to be going away with treatment. Unfortunately, those kinds of pains can also happen when there's a relapse or the disease is progressing and continue right through until death. Uh, so those kinds of pains can have a, a deeper meaning for the child and family that adds another, another layer to treating that pain. And Marie will be talking more about that piece. Children with cancer also have pain, of course, related to the treatment of, the, of their cancer. So postoperative pain, side effects from chemo or radiation, graft versus host disease. Like Daniel, they may have lots of pokes, NG insertions, or other forms of acute of acute pain. In non-malignant diseases, so those other three categories, the underlying causes may be things like gastroesophageal reflux, gastritis, constipation, cystitis, muscle spasticity, pathological fractures, or shunt dysfunction. So how much pain or how prevalent is pain for children with these life-limiting illnesses? In terms of procedural pain, uh, there's some recent research out by the team in children's pain, um, led by Dr. Bonnie Stevens. And in that research, they showed that six 
6.3 painful procedures per day were happening for hospitalized children. And only about 28% of children had one or more pain management interventions documented for those painful procedures. And that would be the same for a child who has a life-limiting life or life-threatening illness. Uh, one study looked at children who had non-malignant life-threatening illnesses and found that parents, 59% of parents said that their child was having pain or severe discomfort all the time, and that was at any point during their child's illness. And as I said before, the, that could be a very long period of time from diagnosis until death. Uh, looking more specifically uh, about pain at the end of life, and most research looks months of life or the last week to days of life, and it's usually looking retrospectively, either using chart reviews or parent reports, looking back at what that last month was like. So on average, children with cancer have 8 to 12 different symptoms present during the last days of their life, and this includes pain, poor appetite, fatigue, lack of mobility, vomiting, sadness, fear, uh, lots of different things. The proportion of parents who actually report that their child suffered a lot or a great deal from pain during the mass last month of life was as high as 66% uh, at one center in Boston, and that was prior to 1997. When they re-looked at children who died after 1997, the proportion of parents who reported their child suffered a lot or a great deal went down to 47%. So there were certainly improvements there but 47% is still pretty high. Uh, similarly, in Sweden, 45% of, of parents felt that their child had unrelieved pain in the last uh, weeks and days of their life. Uh, my own research, this is preliminary results, uh, looking at death for multiple causes and looking at the last week of life. Mothers reported, or 27% of mothers reported that their child suffered a lot or constantly um, from pain during the, that last week of life. And another 27% said they were unsure if their child was in pain. And I think that's almost as bad because um, of the concern that those parents, if they're not sure if their child was in pain or not, are left wondering if they were, if something could have been done to treat that pain. Um, so I find that, that actually quite concerning as well. And some of that is as well due to the impact of pain at end of life. So throughout illness, pain has the same kinds of impacts as for those children who do not have a life-threatening illness. So things like untreated acute pain can lead to chronic pain, those sorts of things. But looking specifically at pain at end of life, the final moments of life are a lasting memory for the, the family and the friends of the child who has died. Uh, and in one study, 57% of parents said they were still affected by their child's unrelieved pain four to nine years after their child's death. Uh, as well, parents report feeling guilty. So daily or weekly feelings of guilt were doubled when the parent also felt that there was little or no access to pain relief during the child's end-of-life care. Uh, another study uh, from the states showed that 10% of parents actually considered hastening their child's death, and this was more likely if their child was in pain. And when they asked parents as well, um, looking back, 34% said that if their child would have been in pain, they would have considered hastening their child's death. So obviously that's a, those are huge things to consider. and. Uh, provide some of the reasons for why pain management is so important for the children and families that uh, we're talking about here. And I came across this quote uh, several years ago that says, we cannot keep them from suffering, but we can keep them from suffering for the wrong reasons. The only way to truly remove all suffering is to be able to wave our magic wand and say to a parent and a child that this is all a bad dream, wake up, go home, and live a long and happy life together. Unfortunately, the, the magic wands are in short supply and we can't do that. But what we can do is make sure that we do everything in our power to prevent or treat all types of pain. And now Maria and Maru are going to tell you how to do that. And maybe while we're switching over, if there's any questions at this point, we'd be happy to entertain those. Right, thanks. Uh, Kim, um, first off, someone pointed out that I referred to you as Maria, I think, earlier, and I do apologize for that. 
they've all signed in on, under one name, and the only name I see is Maria, so I'm probably going to call everyone on that line Maria from now on, but, uh, but I do apologize. But that was Kim Widger who just finished there. Um, we did have one question. Uh, Lindsay has asked, uh, what quadrant do you, when, you, when your slide was up about the four quadrants, what quadrant do you feel kidney failure falls into, for example, kids on dialysis? That would be quadrant one, because they could get a kidney transplant. And so um, there's always a risk that they're going to die while they're waiting for a kidney transplant. Um, so palliative care is appropriate in that situation. But there's also a possibility that they would get a kidney and, and be essentially cured. All right. Well, thanks. And, and this is just another opportunity for me to remind the audience that, that you, when you come up with a question, just feel free to type it into the uh, question box, and we'll compile a list of questions that we can then ask at the next break. So that's the only question for now. So over to you. Uh, I think this is actually Maria this time. <laughs> yes, it is. All right. um, well, I've been tasked with um, trying to address the, the physical part of pain and suffering in pediatric palliative care. Um, and uh, I just want to um, uh, highlight that um, this will be a, a really quick blush or, or brush over um, principles um, and techniques uh, because um, each in and of itself, um, when we're dealing with um, pain uh, management and assessment, um, uh, is uh, at best um, very uh, complicated uh, at times and complex and uh, could take its own webinar uh, on its own. And many of the um, many of the issues have been dealt in some of the other webinars as well. So, so in terms of when we're looking at what would our goals be for pain management for children receiving um, palliative care. What we know is that, in general, um, these four priorities tend to be what parents, families, and the children themselves have told us. And that is to be pain-free or as near pain-free as possible, to be able to move with minimal discomfort, to have minimal or no side effects from medications, and to maintain the ability to interact with others to, ex to the extent that this is a priority for the child and family. And what we have been able to find from limited studies, albeit, but, um, but still good studies, is that these are achievable with what we know as conventional doses and roots of analgesia. And in fact, in 1995, um, Collins et al. Um, in, um, at Memorial Sloan Kettering were able to establish that in children dying with malignancy, only 6% of those patients required what would have been considered um, excessive or massive doses of opioids to control their pain. And of those 6%, only a few needed extraordinary measures such as regional anesthesia. So, um, and again, in 2003, a longitudinal study at a, um, a hospice showed um, that um, the same type of results from opioid infusion from children who are dying, that we, 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 th these um, goals are achievable for children and remain um, things that we should be able to meet and attend to. So one of the key things in terms of uh, pain measurement is assessment. And um, how do we do that in pediatrics? So um, there are primarily four um, ways used for pain and uh, ass assessing pain in palliative care. Uh, the unidimensional self-report measures, behavioral observation measures, multidimensional symptom assessment scales, and then pain measurement in children with neurocognitive impairment. And um, the reason there are a number is because we don't have really good uh, research to support um, any one of these measures to be used solely, but certainly um, uh, it will depend on the child, the family, and the caregiver. And as Kim was talking about, the quadrants within which that child appears will help you, guide you in which assessment tool makes the most sense. So we're going to talk a little bit about each of the, the types of measures and just give you some examples to help guide you a little bit in making those decisions. 
Unidimensional measures usually are based on severity. And they, the data tends to support the use of these visual analog scales for children who are five and older. Um, the verbal rating scales haven't been shown to be as useful or reliable, um, but the children should be able to understand that the proportionality and conceptualize their pain experience along a continuum. And the example I've included below is the Wong Baker faces scale. So as you see, as things go up progressively, you see an increase um, in the numbers. And there's both a visual and a numerical component to it. The, behavior obs the behavioral observation measures tend to be um, subjective um, distress of acute pain manifested in, in certain facial, verbal, and motor responses. Um, these measures in, uh, with children um, have checklists and usually require trained observers um, to record the occurrence of certain behaviors. Um, the combination of frequency, duration of behaviors is integrated with a value and an integrated index of anxiety, pain, fear, and distress. But they are interpreted as, as a global pain score. So as you can see, an example up there is the FLAC score. And it looks at the movement of faces, legs, activity, crying, and consolability, and rates it on a scale of uh, a scoring method of 0 through 2. Pain measurement um, in the uh, ch child with neurodegenerative impairment um, in and itself is a little bit more complex. But we do have tools who can help with us. And, and it impacts, obviously, with the child's ability to uh, communicate verbally. Um, the physical aspects of certain illnesses as well, um, the grimacing or hypertonia, often um, are also behaviors that are associated with pain. So what, what we have done, sorry, sorry. What we, have, um, what we have been able to come up with, or what has been come up with through some researchers um, at the IWK is the Non-Communicating Children's Pain Checklist, the NCCPCR, which again uses a combination of verbal, social, facial activity, movement of body, limbs, physiological responses, and eating and sleeping, and gives us a category, uh, a, a global score in all of the different categories that gives an indication over a course of a period of two hours where that child sits in terms of their, their pain. The multidimensional symptom assessment uses um, the idea of not just pain, but all symptoms associated, um, which is very much a part of palliative care in children. There aren't that many of those tools out there. And this the tool that I've put up here is um, the Memorial Symptom Assessment Scale developed by Collins and all at Memorial Stone Kettering. And it's a modified version of the adult um, MSAS. And really, they've got two versions, one that's available for children um, from 7 to 12, and then one for children 10 to 18. And it really tries to address simple questions and can be complete, completed in about 11 minutes by the child or the child and parent, um, and just answer certain questions about um, how, to, how they are dealing with certain symptoms that appear. Pain is usually measured um, in three dimensions, severity, frequency, and distress. And what we have here is just an example of one of the sections, which is one on anxiety. So when we look at the measurement of pain, it's also important to recognize that there are many myths and misperceptions about pain in children. And oftentimes, um, what we have seen as some of the bigger ones that have occurred in the literature is that people often feel that the meaning of increasing pain severity is a marker of disease progression. Um, and that's just an example of many parents having this idea that as their child's um, pain changes, that oftentimes um, they, they feel that that means the disease is progressing. And we know that that's not necessarily true. 
sometimes the meaning of certain drugs used. So certainly um, for many families and even healthcare professionals, the use of, of opioids such as morphine um, is um, an indicator to them that things must be changing. And certainly the whole idea of tolerance, dependence, and addiction um, are some myths and uh, is one of some of the myths associated with pain in children. Um, many believe that tolerance and dependence and addiction can happen if used for too long or will develop as a result of use of certain opioids. So it's important to recognize that these exist. It's important to recognize that they're part of your assessment um, and recognizing um, how they might inhibit um, appropriate management of pain in children at this stage of their illness. So we're going to try a poll question. So which statement is the most accurate when considering pain management guidelines? One, the choice of analgesics is based on weight of the child. Two, one should always start with an adjuvant drug first. Three, one should switch analgesics based on side effects. And four, the choice of analgesics is based on pain severity and balance analgesia and side effects. So we can see that uh, the first choice, the choice of analgesics is based on the weight of the child, only got 2%. Uh, one should always start with an adjuvant drug first, 2% as well. One should switch analgesics based on the side effects, only got 2%, and 93% of the people chose the last one, which was the choice of analgesics is based on pain severity. Excellent. That was an easy question, I guess. <laughs> So in terms of pain management guidelines, um, it, the gold standard that continues to be used um, throughout internationally is really the, the World Health Organization ladder. And it still remains tried and true in terms of understanding how we escalate and um, use proper pain management. Certainly there are local adaptations that often can be made. But the optimum, optimum results are best achieved with the best analgesia um, used with minimum side effects. So we will proceed to talk a little bit about um, the different um, methods that we would use, the different analgesia that we would use for mild, uh, mild to moderate and moderate to severe pain to better understand how we move up the um, WHO ladder. So in terms of analgesia, primarily um, we look at acetaminophen and um, NSAIDs as our drugs of choice for mild pain. And certainly things to think about in terms of acetaminophen is that it can oftentimes be contraindicated in children with neutropenia. We don't have any um, good data on safety for chronic use in children, uh, but it tends to be the drug of choice. In terms of NSAIDs, uh, I think the important thing to remember is that, um, again, it can be uh, problematic for those who are at risk for bleeding, in particular um, children with thrombocytopenia, um, but are, again, are great for um, children in other populations. Codeine itself is being used less, frequency in pediat less frequent in pediatrics. And uh, in particular, at, um, in, at sick children, it's now become off formulary, so it's not even available on the formulary. In one pediatric study, um, it uh, did show that 35% of children showed um, an inadequate conversion of codeine to morphine. So it certainly is not the drug of choice, um, even in mild to moderate pain. Tramadol itself um, uh, has been used often um, in moderate cancer pain, but there's really little data on e efficacy um, in pediatric uh, cancer or chronic illness. Oxycodone um, comes with its own um, concerns, and particularly that it is only available with, um, with acetaminophen, which may be a limiting for the dosages increase. 
And it certainly has a shorter half-life and a higher clearance value as compared to um, adults in, in pediatrics. Morphine is the most widely used for moderate to severe pain and has a variable response um, in humans, which may, explain, may be explained by uh, genetic variation and differences in opioid uh, receptors and neurotransmitter responses. Morphine is, is bound to plasma proteins and is age-dependent. Therefore, um, in preterm infants, it's important to remember that less than 20% is bound. And so, therefore, um, volume of dis distribution is linear and related to age and body surface area. After the neonatal period, however, um, uh, it is the same as adults, and, and therefore, um, its distribution is the same to three months of life, and therefore, starting doses should be reduced by 25 to 30 percent on a per, per kilo basis, and it is available um, as sustained release or immediate release. Hydromorphone can be used uh, when doses uh, become limited in, uh, by side effects with regards to morphine or the volume um, for IV administration becomes uh, prohibitive uh, because of the volume in morphine. Uh, it's shown to be very effective in studies for mucositis pain, um, and it has a high potency and aqueous solubility, and uh, therefore it makes it quite effective for subcutaneous infusions. With fentanyl, it's important to remember that it's a synthetic opioid, um, often used in severe pain. Half-life is prolonged in infants. It may also be used for those with dose-limiting side effects of morphine. Um, rapid administration, however, we caution, may cause chest wall rigidity and severe ventilatory difficulty. Uh, oral transmucosal fentanyl has been shown to be efficacious well used in children and um, especially with procedural pain. And transdermal uh, fentanyl has been known to use in the adult population. However, the studies are quite limited in children, but has been used quite extensively, uh, in particular in children uh, with cancer pain. Methadone, again, a highly uh, synthetic um, opioid has a very long half-life and uh, is quite variable. And there's quite a risk of delayed sedation and overdose occurring after several days of initiating treatment due to this long half-life. Um, frequent assessment is needed to ensure safe and um, efficacious use of the methadone. There are many routes of administration uh, available for analgesia. Um, I think the important key things to remember in this patient population is that we often um, think of oral as the best, but it may not uh, be most useful for all populations in the palli pediatric palliative care uh, population, and that we should consider subcutaneous um, or intravenous or patient-controlled analgesia more often. It's important to remember with the subcutaneous, the, uh, the most limiting feature of subcutaneous is volume, and it's recommended that one to three mils um, per hour is the most that will be tolerated um, in the pediatric population. The next thing I wanted to just highlight is the pediatric pain crisis. And the important pieces of the, the pediatric pain crisis to remember is that um, when we're looking at uh, a crisis with children in pain, that they, we have lots of things that we can do to help eliminate that crisis. And our normal um, routes of administration and our normal um, analgesia that we have at access can be adopted, adapted, and uh, used to um, be considered. And breakthrough pain, um, it's important to recognize that we regularly prescribe breakthrough um, analgesia with children, um, that we don't uh, wait for um, PRN dosing. Opioid dose, dose escalation, uh, what's important to remember with uh, this is that it should be done in a measured response, that we should consider anywhere from 10 to 30 percent escalation based on the background infusion. 
and that it be done measured um, over the course of time at, to avoid um, the common side effects that we may see. Opioid switching is another uh, way to deal with a pediatric pain crisis. Oftentimes what you will see or can see is um, uh, dose limiting effects due to um, side effects as doses increase. So it can make sense to switch from a drug such as morphine to hydromorphone, although in the same family, um, the, the way they interact um, and are used pharmacologically can be um, much better in a child uh, once they are switched. The side effects of opioids oftentimes become a limiting feature um, and create a pain crisis when in fact what we do know is that if we anticipate those side effects ahead of time, things such as nausea vomiting, constipation um, being two of the main ones, we can eliminate those side effects um, by monitoring and having drugs on board available to help reduce some of those side effects. Um, other approaches that we should consider are regional anesthetic blocks, but again, those are things that are to be used as a last resort. And as we said, if we use the pain management guidelines as outlined through the WHO, we can actually achieve good analgesia and support. Another poll question. So which statement is false with regards to other modalities for pain management and palliative care? Should not be considered as a standalone therapy without analgesia. Have some proven benefit for pain relief depending on the type of pain. Have strong evidence of therapeutic benefit in pediatric palliative manage pain management. The method of action in relieving pain is often not known. Just while we're waiting, we did have uh, someone put in a, a uh, sort of a comment as opposed to a question. I think in reference to uh, your slide about uh, where, when you mentioned oxycodone only being available in conjunction with acetaminophen. Someone has mentioned, and I don't know if this is true or not, but that, that it's, it is available on its own. Um, they have tablets available as five milligrams of oxycodone, and also oxycodone is available as a sustained release prep. Um, I'm not sure if you wanted to provide it. If, if if I thought maybe we do have a number of participants from the United States, I thought that that might have been the case, that maybe it was something that's available there and not here, but I did check and this person's email address is from the IWK in Nova Scotia. So um, so I'm not sure if, it, if this is something that you're aware of or? Um, so to the best of my knowledge, um, it's not available everywhere uh, on its own and certainly in it, it may be in some areas. Um, so I, uh, to, to the to the best of my knowledge, it's not available everywhere um, as a standalone product. All right. All right thanks. Uh, so we'll just close off this poll, and we'll flip it back. So uh, the first statement should not be considered as a standalone therapy uh, was 26%. Uh, have, pro have some proven benefit for pain relief uh, it was 18%. Have strong evidence of, th of therapeutic benefit was 24%. And the method of action relieving pain is often not known was was 32 percent, so fairly well distributed across those those answer choices. All right, so I will see if uh, any answers come from what I I quickly review. So other modalities of pain management that should be considered, along with the um, analgesia that uh, we talked about, um, adjuvant analgesic. Um, which really are the list that we have below, antidepressants, psychostimulants, anticonvulsants, corticosteroids, and neuroleptics can often be used in conjunction with um, our um, analgesia um, or and often in, in conjunction with our opioids um, to help potentiate or better control pain. Um, when we talk about um, our adjuvants, oftentimes um, they they will be prescribed. They're prescribed for other things other than pain, but um, some of their other effects can be very helpful with uh, the pain crisis. Antidepressants that um, 
often um, have been used um, are tricyclic antidepressants. And they have been used in a variety of pain conditions in adults, including um, post-herpetic um, neuralgia, diabetic neuro neuropathy, tension headache, and migraine headaches. Um, they certainly have uh, been shown to be effective in neuropathic pain um, and have similar uh, effects as anticonvulsants, but um, it's still, there aren't enough studies to really um, decide which drug is the best drug of choice. Psychostimulants such as Ritalin um, have been used to help um, combat the side effect of sedation or somnolence in particular um, and, um, and have helped uh, some patients. Again, studies are minimal in uh, pediatrics but certainly have been shown in some um, adult studies to help reduce some of the insomnia. Um, that uh, that or the stimulants that may be related to opioids. Corticosteroids um, uh, that we talk talk about sometimes, in particular dexamethasone, have been um, shown to help reduce some of the um, swelling, pain related to swelling and edema, um, and uh, can be used. Anticonvulsants again. Um, oftentimes can be effective with neuropathic pain. Neuroleptics um, have not been um, effectively shown in pediatrics um, necessarily um, and certainly should not be used as standalone um, uh, drugs in pain management. So um, just to quickly wrap up, this was just a brief overview and blush. Um, the references are not included in your slide. They, I will attach those and send those off to CAPSI. Um, I just want to close with regards to the management of physical pain and suffering, that the degree to which a child or their caregiver believes pain is well managed can influence many other outcomes, such as where a family might choose to care for their child or the end of life phase. Good pain control, on the other hand, can mean the difference between memories of distress and angst or memories that the family will want to hold on to. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that if done well and done with good assessment and management guidelines, we can achieve uh, the outcomes that families are looking for. All right, thanks, Maria. Uh, we did have one, or someone did uh, comment in the questions earlier about uh, sound uh, it, it being a little bit hard to hear. I, I'm just for the audience's information, I'm in Ottawa, they're in Toronto. I can, it sounds good on my end, but uh, just perhaps if someone is having a little bit diff little bit difficulty hearing, uh, perhaps the speakers could just be a little bit more closer to the phone or speak a little bit louder. Uh, I'm not sure if it's, uh, if it's on our end or their end, because as I said, it sounds good to me. So, uh, But that's just one little comment. Uh, a couple questions for you, uh, Maria. Um, back referring to your list of uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, someone has asked, is acetaminophen is acetaminophen contraindicated in children with neutropenia due to the antipyret antipyretic effects or any or for any other reason? It's for the antipyretic effects, yes. Is, is that the only reason or is, so you're saying it, it is contraindicated for that or is there any other reason it would be contraindicated? Primary reason but also related to, um, uh, uh, yeah, that's the primary reason. Okay. Um, Another question, Kathy has asked, are there any new recommendations for extreme dyspnea in patients who are otherwise well oxygenated but remain dyspneic? Any new recommendations? So um, certainly in terms, I don't think there are any new recommendations. I think what, um, what again, limited studies have shown in adult populations not been well documented other than in um, some studies with children uh, with end-stage uh, lung disease uh, such as cystic fibrosis. Certainly the use, the regular use of opioids has been shown to be effective in helping to reduce the sensation related to dyspnea. And using them orally or intravenously, there's no, um, the studies are fairly clear with regards to um, nebulized morphine that it's, it's shown to be no more effective than um, placebo. Okay. 
Uh, someone has asked uh, what, uh, if, if you can just um, tell, tell us what was the correct answer from the last poll question, since a number of the uh, options were, were close. So what, was the, what was the correct answer? Um, four, I believe. Let me just double-check. In that the method of action relieving pain is often not known? Yes. Okay. There we go. Uh, another question has come in. Shannon has asked, uh, what do you see... What do you see the role of integrative therapies playing in pain management? Um, I think integrative therapies are the next new frontier and, um, in pain management, in particular in this population. What we don't have, again, is a lot of evidence to support their use. And what I would encourage, um, and certainly we've seen a few studies out on um, acupuncture and guided imagery. Um, but uh, I think that um, if we look at the WHO pain management guidelines, they, they on each level they speak about the use of some of those adjuvant analgesia, and I would suggest that adjuvant therapy should also be added onto those as a key um, support mechanism to help the, the effectiveness of the drug use. All right. Thank you very much for that. Uh, that's that's all the questions that we we have on the list right now. So again, I encourage people to continue to to uh, send your questions in, and we'll now uh, hand over to Maru. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Maru. As you know, I'm the psychologist, and therefore I will address the aspects of uh, pain and suffering in pediatric palliative care that are specific psychologically. Um, psychologically in focus. I do want to say before I begin, though, that as most of you know, uh, psychologists in the last uh, 30 years have uh, conducted a lot of research assessing uh, on one hand and then treating different types of pain. But my presentation today will not be focused on that aspect. There is a lot of evidence-based um, psychological intervention that have been proven in, con in, uh, in conjunction with pharmacological interventions to be effective in managing different types of pain, including guided imagery, distraction, and hypnosis. So I just wanted to put that aside so that we can go to the other aspects of suffering uh, that often are not being addressed in pediatric palliative care. And the most common psychological difficulties that impact on pain management and increase. Sorry about that. We are OK. We didn't have a big accident, only a little one. That increase suffering uh, are anxiety, um, such as different types of fears and post-traumatic stress, mood changes, uh, irritability, symptoms of depression, cognitive changes, and behavioral changes. In today's presentation, I will only focus on the first two aspects of uh, psychological difficulty. Uh, we could spend the entire um, uh, session speaking of each one of them. But um, because of the role of anxiety in pain perception is so critical, as well as in suffering, I think it's important that we begin with anxiety. So first, let's try to define what anxiety is. It's a normal reaction to life stressors and uncertainty. As we all know, a little anxiety is good for you. Um, I'm sure my colleagues, Maria and Kim and I, have a little anxiety when we were presenting and when we were preparing this because we wanted to do a good job. And that's what provides motivation for action. Anxiety, however, can become problematic when its intensity and duration affect daily functioning even during palliative care. The psychological symptoms of anxiety are feeling an ease, having a sense of being uh, uh, apprehensive, being irritable, being worried, anticip uh, anticipation to negative outcomes, and totally being focused on those kinds of outcomes. Inability to turn off negative thoughts. In terms of the physical symptoms most of you are familiar with, um, uh, sleeping difficulties, feeling tense, having stomach pains or butterflies in your stomach, nausea, palpitations, and chest tightness. 
um, I wanted to separate what is typically known as anxiety disorders from symptoms of anxiety that may not reach the clinical level of uh, anxiety to be considered a disorder, and anxiety symptoms that are associated with a reaction to a physical illness or to pain. We know that in children, the prevalence of anxiety disorders in general is 13%. It is a little higher with children that have chronic illnesses, uh, 24%. Um, in terms of the primary anxiety disorders that we know, um, we have generalized anxiety, panic attacks, obsessive compulsive um, anxiety, phobias, and post-traumatic stress. Now, the anxieties that are related to physical illnesses are general symptoms of uh, maladjustment uh, with anxious mood, different types of phobias, and post-traumatic stress. And we will talk a little bit more about that uh, uh, later. Now, to depression. Um, mood changes are characterized by deep sadness, can be transient or prolonged, and can impair daily functioning. A diagnosis of depression is determined by the number of symptoms and its duration, and of course, the intensity as well. Now, in children, the symptoms are present with sadness, lack of pleasure in daily life, irritability, crying spells, difficulties with concentration, lack of adherence, and behavioral difficulties. Now, in children with life-limited illnesses or at the end of life, depressive symptoms can be normal responses to their circumstances, especially when a child is aware of their many losses and when the child is aware that he is actually dying. The prevalence of mood disorders in children is only 2% in school-age children, but Four to eight percent in adolescents, and in chronic in chronically ill children is <clears throat> a little higher, nine percent. But this will vary from diseases to diseases. <clears throat> in terms of the actual disorders, major depression and major mood disorders like uh, bipolar disorders are considered to be uh, critical. But in children, we know that mood disorders. Uh, uh, are, uh, can be psychological reactions to physical illnesses, uh, maladjustment disorders with depressive mood. Regression in their own development is also um, a, a mood um, a reaction. And of course, um, anticipatory uh, bereavement when children are aware of the many losses that they have had in their life, such as um, the loss of health, um, the loss of um, friendships, uh, the loss of um, activities that they used to be able to do and are no longer able to do. Now, let's look at anxiety and depression, pain and suffering in palliative care. The most common symptoms that we know um, in palliative care, pain, nausea, agitation, fatigue, and loss of appetite or excessive appetite, <clears throat> fear of abandonment and death, deep sadness and depression symptoms are common psychological symptoms of suffering in palliative care that must be managed to achieve comfort for the child and the family. I have underlined here fear of abandonment and fear of loss. Many children who are at the end of life or who have a life-limited illness, they are afraid to go to sleep at night. They are afraid of the dark. They are afraid that the primary caregiver, mother, father, whoever, uh, leaves the, the room because they don't want to be alone. They are afraid that something will happen to them if they are left alone. Um, and again, those are very common um, symptoms in children who are in palliative care. Okay. 
It is well known, however, that the psychological symptoms of suffering in a child with a life-limited illness and the family are not well managed. And this is a concern that I would like to address today. How can we manage those uh, symptoms and how can we best help the child and the family? In my tree for psychological palliative care that you have in front, um, I try to put, give you a, a gestalt, a, a, a molar view of all the possible things that we can do because we can do a lot of different things provided that we are able to detect some of the symptoms, either symptoms of anxiety or symptoms of depression that are typically associated with a child who is suffering. So let's just focus on feelings of sadness, sorrow, fear, anger, frustration, grieving, grieving again losses and grieving uh, the loss of their health and mourning over yourself. Um, I have two branches of my tree, one that I call the expression of those feelings and one that I call not expressing the feelings, not being able to communicate to others. Let's deal first with the area in which uh, the feelings are not expressed. Uh, when a child has envy of the siblings because the siblings are able to go to school and do healthy, normal things that the child with a limited illness is unable to do, refusing meals of meds because that's perhaps the only control that the child has, having temper tantrums, having a lot of rage and disconnect with others. It, it gives a limited information and limited um, 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 behaviors for others to act, but when the child is able to communicate, then you can do many things. You can say, well, clearly you can see when the child is angry, when the child has a lot of um, envy. You can see it uh, even if the child is not expressing because the child is, is uh, disconnected. The, the critical problem in the non-expressing here is that the child disconnects with others. So long as the child connects either verbally or non-verbally or behaviorally, then you are able to do something about it. So the most important thing is that you're able to provide comfort so that the child can trust that you can help him, as well as respect the feelings of the child. Um, it is very important that you see this child not only in isolation, but within the context of his parents, in the context of brothers and sisters, because they will provide comfort to the child, and that will increase trust as well. It is important that you promote communication within the family, between family members, and between the family and the, care uh, the caregiver team, uh, the palliative care team, and the rest of the other um, uh, specialists who are working with the child and the family. Um, once you have comfort, and comfort is usually associated with pain medication, but the psychological aspects of it is what you're trying to achieve with the interventions that you will try to implement. <clears throat> it is important that you have uh, professionals that can assess different aspects of pain and suffering, including the psychological aspects of it. Once you have an adequate assessment of what is it that is uh, bothering the child and whether or not we have anxiety issues, whether or not we have mood issues, um, how can we best assess and how can we best treat the child? Uh, in the next component of the tree, you see redirect and problem solving. There are many different approaches that uh, healthcare professionals in the psychosocial branches, like psychologists, child life specialists, um, social workers, etc., can use. Other different types of therapies, like uh, art therapies, music therapies, and so on and so forth. But the redirect and problem solving is usually based on what we call cognitive behavioral therapy 
that uses techniques such as relaxation and visual imagery to problem solve with the child or with the parents or with the siblings and address the issues and redirect the behaviors of the child. But again, we have our therapy in, in which the child can express what those feelings are and then talk about the feelings and find different um, approaches to address what is bothering the child. Um, so let's, you can take this tree and explore it in many ways you want to, but I'd like to go on to talk about specific things that we can also do. And there are concrete suggestions that you can take to trying to reduce suffering in pediatric palliative care. It is very important that we take the time to listen to the child's worries and fears. Um, oftentimes, we do a lot of talking. We need to learn to do more listening. Once you listen to what the child is telling you, it needs to be the right environment. It is important that you do not dismiss it and tell the child, oh, you don't need to worry. Don't worry. Uh, there's nothing to be fearful of. If the child expresses the fear, is because it's real for the child. So it's also important that you listen to the parents and the siblings' worries. Uh, the child, as we said, a, in life is part of the family. And if the child has a chronic illness or life-limited illnesses, it impacts on the child and the rest of the family. And when the child is at the end of life, the circle of trust for the child becomes smaller and smaller. And those who are closest to the child are a necessity for the child to be able to continue to have quality of life. So it is important that the needs of parents and siblings are equally addressed. You need to answer the questions honestly and to remain calm. And I use to remain calm uh, addressing it to the healthcare professional because when we work with a chronic, a chronically ill children or children who have life-limited illnesses, we, in these professions, in palliative care, we are caring individuals. And the impact is also felt on us uh, as compassionate health care providers. So we need to address our own feelings, but not in front of the child or the child's family. Uh, and that could be an other uh, uh, webinar that could be addressed uh, at a different time, the care of the caregiver. Um, so that when you are with the child and the family, make sure you don't rush. Oftentimes, one of the main complaints we hear from parents is that, oh, the doctors are so busy. I mean, they stay by the door, and they don't even walk in there, and they're checking at the watch. And uh, we feel that whatever worries we have, they're not too important. But I think this perception we need to address. Uh, any worries that parents, children have are important, and they need to be addressed compassionately and with great respect. We need to promote open communication. And I cannot stress, stress that enough, not only within the family, but between family members and the core uh, palliative care team. We need to show confidence in the child and the family in their abilities to cope with the situation. For that, therefore, we need to empower them. Because when a child is dying, when the child has a life-limited limited illness, parents do not know what to do. We are getting into uncharted territories. And oftentimes, that's the case for the healthcare team as well. But we need to convey trust so that we can work together collaboratively with the child and with the family. Um, we need to teach the child and family specific strategies to communicate and to manage the fears. When you create an environment of trust, it's more likely that parents will tell you what their concerns are. It's more likely that kids will tell you what their fears are. We need to ensure that the, the pediatric palliative care team has the resources available to assess and to treat psychological symptoms of suffering. 
Maybe those could be having music therapists, maybe having play therapists, maybe have psychologists or child life specialists to address the fears, the worries, the mood changes, the behavioral problems, the, um, the other concerns that parents and children may have. Most children at the end of life are aware that they're dying, but they need permission to express their knowledge and related fears. I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, the work by Maya um, uh, Bloombone Langner or um, some of the work that Barbara Swords uh, has done with children who are dying. Even children as, um, as young as four and five years of age are aware that something is happening and that the disease is not controlled or that the treatment is not working. Oftentimes, children observe their parents and take their cues from their parents. Or they observe the healthcare, in the healthcare team and take the cues from them when they know that keeping quiet is the best way to address the problem. My own work interviewing children with incurable disease and their parents confirmed the need for normalcy, for control, and hope. No matter how sick a child is, the child would like to do similar things that a brother and sister or their peers or the classmates are doing. They want to have um, a, a, a chat uh, with their classmates. Uh, they want to go in MSM. They, they would like to watch videos with friends etc. If they are girls, they would like to have their nails done, they would like to have etc. Uh, kids would love to continue to be as normal as they can. And it is something that we can encourage families to nourish. <clears throat> the issues of control are so critical, not only for parents, but for children as well. When a child is very sick, they lose many, many of the activities that they used to have control of, many of the skills that they used to have, like dressing themselves, um, bathing, eating, etc. So um, just because they are unable to do those activities, it does not mean that they still don't have the same needs to show competencies in any kind of activities or any kinds of abilities that they still have uh, in the, uh, uh, at the end of their life. Um, again, hope. No matter how aware children are of their condition, no matter how uh, aware they are that perhaps they are dying, um, hope is something that will stay with the parent or with the child to the last minute. Uh, perhaps the hope is not for a cure at that point, but it is the hope for having a good day, the hope to um, have a smile on your face, the hope that the pain will be reduced. But hope is so important for the child and for the parents it, to have good quality of life. <clears throat> and by addressing both the physical and the psychological symptoms of suffering during palliative care, we can contribute to improve the quality of life for the child who is at the end of life and for the family. <clears throat> I'm going to stop here and hopefully you have some questions for me or for my colleagues, uh, whether they're questions about pain management or some psychological aspects of pain management, uh, we will be happy to address them. Oh, one more thing. I have um, put at the end of the presentation some uh, psychological references. Um, uh, some of them I mentioned to uh, in my presentation. The majority of, no, uh, of those um, references are for you to have for future. Right. Are there any questions? Yeah, thanks, Mary. Well, there, there's been one actually comment. Uh, she she calls it as opposed to a question. Um, Megan Megan has said uh, she appreciates Maru's comments regarding psychological management of pain 
She thinks it's very important to avoid the dualistic physical versus psychological pain phenomena as all pain has both an emotional and sensory component. She puts in brackets, and we know that negative emotions such as fear can increase pain perception. She also goes on to say that when one considers this, it makes much more sense to investigate a variety of methods of intervention, including medication, but also psychological and other integrative therapies to manage pain in all populations. So any, any comment to that? Anything to add to that? I, mean, I think she basically supports a lot of what you've just, just uh, said there. And I support everything she says, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, and uh, just a reminder, there is, you know, again, we, we've got about 10 more minutes left in the scheduled session. You know, if you do have any questions, please start typing them in now. We'll, uh, we'll, we should have time to get through through all the questions that we have so far, so there, there should be plenty of time. So please please type in any questions that you have. Uh, uh, Kathy, had, sorry, go ahead. Yes, uh, with regards to Megan's comment, um, as um, I'm sure all of you know, given the previous presentations that you have and, pre uh, and given what Maria and Kim have presented, um, pain, uh, the, you cannot differentiate pain from the psychological components of it. Uh, clearly, uh, anxiety and anticipatory anxiety will exacerbate the perception of pain. Um, for the presentation, I chose to speak about uh, anxiety and depression separately because usually those components, those psychological components, are not addressed on their own and they refer in a more general way as suffering. And the way we, we would like to see this is those symptoms, whether they are uh, depressive symptoms, symptoms of anxiety, and pain perception, they are all components of suffering. And we need to address them uh, adequately by assessing them and then treating them. Um, oftentimes, uh, when you have symptoms of uh, depression, for example, those symptoms can become quite severe. And you could have dual uh, uh, diagnosis so that the uh, depression could be addressed uh, pharmacologically, and that will improve the perception of pain, will reduce pain, as well as will improve the quality of life uh, of the child. So again, uh, while I chose to separate the psychological aspects, by all means, I did not imply that they are separate. All right, thanks for that clarification. That's, that's excellent. Um, Kathy has asked, uh, what type of partnerships do you develop with the child's school, spiritual group, Boy Scouts, athletic teams, etc.? <clears throat> That's a very good question. Uh, I can speak from um, our experience in Toronto at the Hospital for Sick Children, and we encourage a, um, a, a close relationship with the community. Uh, to increase the, the support for the child and the family. So that will include schools, um, religious affiliations, um, um, other community resources, and the, uh, the hospital multidisciplinary teams uh, have the facilities to integrate back and forth, work with the community, so that we can, for example, we may use um, going to school as palliative care. For a child who is at the end of life, the focus will not necessarily be on the academic, but it, the focus will be to normalize the child's life. Uh, so uh, I'd like to ask my colleagues if they would like to comment or add uh, to that, Maria. No, I don't think there's much more to add other than that, um, uh, again, um, it's important to include all those aspects in that whole idea of the the global view of pain and as pain as a, a, a you know a total a expression of a total experience and certainly the social aspects um, are important to address with a child as Maru was talking about um, because they will help in terms of managing that pain flash and or suffering that is often associated with it. Thanks. And I was just about to encourage uh, all of our panelists to jump in with their comments, and they've gone and done that, which is, which is excellent. Um, so uh, the next question Shannon has asked, how do you talk with a child who doesn't want to open up? That's a very good question. And that's where the skills come um, 
a child who doesn't want to open up has all the rights to not wanting to open up. And it's um, the skill of the, um, the adults, the healthcare professionals, um, are such that first you need to take the pressure off. Um, sit with the child. If the child is watching television, you watch television with the child. Um, there's, there is the implicit acceptance that clearly the child who doesn't want to talk is likely to have a lot of frustration, is likely to have anger because of the situation the child is in. And uh, oftentimes, they will like to talk at the most unusual times, maybe 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, when um, the, um, the staff is limited in the hospital, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, when the child is hospitalized. And if the nurse has time and the child is away, the, child, uh, the, the bedside nurse may come and say, can I just sit with you? That will be the time where the child may choose to talk. That information, as you work collaboratively in a multidisciplinary team, that information could be shared so that perhaps bringing a different um, therapists, like play therapists, music therapists, um, art therapists, so that to entice any kinds of interest that the child may have, so the child could begin to express his feelings in a different way than with words. So again, it is important that you have resources available to assist the child to communicate. And it doesn't just need to be talking. Uh, Mary Jean said uh, hello from Halifax. Uh, she says, as a follow-up to Jerry's uh, comment on oxycodone, she says she's confirmed that it is available in Canada through, uh, within the CPS uh, without being combined with acetaminophen. Um, and in addition, she has another comment. She says, my co her comment is related to two of the pain scales that were mentioned. Uh, the FACES pain scale, she says, is usually recommended over the Wong-Baker scale because of the neutrality of the anchors. Uh, the Wong, Wong Baker anchors express sad and happy, not no pain versus severe pain. Uh, she says also for the NCCPC, it has been validated for a period of 10 minutes of observation in the post-op version instead of two hours, which she says is most convenient at hospital. Uh, she says the team is currently validating a five minutes version too. So that's just a couple of comments. Anything, anything to add to that, any, any one of our panelists? No comments. All right. Um, Kathy is uh, Kathy, uh, a different Kathy, is uh, saying, as, as you say, and I think she's referring to you, Maru, she says, children often know they are dying. Uh, she says, what does one say when asked, in quotes, am I dying, by a child whose parents have not addressed this or do not want this addressed? <laughs> That's a very good question. And as difficult as the question is, is one of the toughest ones. Um, when a child asks you that if the child is dying, uh, I usually respond to the child, um, do you think that you are dying? And the child will say, well, yes. I said, what led you to believe that you are dying? And if the child is able to talk, that will give me more information. Um, if the child then say, am I going to die, I will say, well, we are all going to die. We don't know when we are going to die. But what we do know is that, and then I can address the, how the disease is responding or not responding to the treatment, if that information is already available. If the information is not available, then I could discuss with the child and say, well, maybe we can address this question with, I'm thinking oncologist, because I'm thinking a child with cancer, for example. Uh, maybe uh, we can ask your oncologist to come and talk. And we will ask whether or not the treatment that you are receiving is to, uh, to cure the disease or is so that uh, the disease uh, does not come, uh, causes you more discomfort. So it will depend on the circumstances. Uh, as a healthcare professional, 
I'm always very careful to make sure that I do not give a child information that um, is, uh, is information that should be given by the oncologist. Um, but assuming that the child knows that um, the treatment is not longer to cure the leukemia or to cure the tumor, then um, it's, um, it, it's, it's a difficult answer, but um, I sometimes will confirm that, yes, a, a, you are, but we don't know for how long. Um, um, but the most important thing is that you are alive, and we are doing things to continue to live. So um, I don't try to be evasive, but the answer is not an easy answer. And I don't know if my colleagues uh, would like to add anything to that. Uh, um, I have to agree with Maru. It's not an easy question to answer. And part of the strategies that we try to use is to explore what the child understands about his or her illness. Uh, because oftentimes what we found is in terms of the question being asked isn't so much about the dying part or uh, actually about are they dying, but it's about what they're afraid of um, and, and trying to address those fears. So trying to, to dig a little bit deep before you come out and just say yes you are or no you're not is trying to understand where that question is coming from. Thanks. Um, we just had a question about the two pain scales that were in the comment from the group from Halifax. Um, the two pain scales that they mentioned were the FACES pain scale, uh, and that's all capitalized, so I assume that's the official name of that scale, the, the FACES pain scale, uh, and the Wong Baker. Um, do, you, do you guys, have, since we're being asked this question, do you guys have any comment on the accuracy of the one versus the other that you wanted to add to any of the previous discussions? I don't, I don't actually have any comment on the accuracy. I certainly, from my perspective, um, uh, would say that uh, each locally, each um, institution, each area chooses to look at, at using what works best for them. In terms of uh, the, the FACES scale over the Wong-Baker scale, certainly um, I, I know that there have been some comparator studies out there. Um, and, and certainly the comments made by IWK are out there in the literature as, as um, more of the accuracy uh, tending to be towards the FACES scale in terms of uh, eliminating out the emotion versus the actual pain. Um, but we do have, as was highlighted at the beginning of our um, talk, uh, there are other webinars that address pain assessment tool. Um, very specifically in terms of uh, their use and measurement and whatnot. My talk was really a very quick overview of some of the types of tools and, and how they compare in terms of unidimensional behavior, multidimensional assessment. I was actually just going to point that out that one of our previous webinars that is on the Knowledge Exchange Network it did talk specifically about assessment of pain. So and they did go into a much more detailed description of some of the, the assessment tools. So so excellent suggestion to go and for anyone who has who wants more information about that, please please do check that out. And someone did ask us to repeat that website and the, the website where these webinars are hosted is the, is the is CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network, which is at ken.cafc.org. That's k e n dot c a p h c dot org. Um, there's just a, we've got a, a bunch of questions coming in here, so I'm I'm hoping we can uh, get through them all. Uh, one of the questions was, uh, and as long as the presenters, I just I guess I should ask, are you guys able? We have gone over our scheduled time by five minutes now. Are, are all of our presenters able to hang on for about uh, three or four uh, more questions? Yes, we are. Okay. Um, well, I had someone asking again, what's the website? Uh, it is well. Actually, everyone that's on this website will be getting an email when the uh, the the this webinar is posted. So uh, uh, it is Ken, as in the name Ken, Ken and Barbie, sort of Ken, Ken dot org, and CAFC is the acronym for Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. But everyone will get to get an email following when 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 the information is available. 
And the, the other uh, thing just to point out about the CAN is that it does have an opportunity for people to post comments. So if, there, if people do want to have a discussion about the various tools that are available, please feel free to post your comments on, on those pages on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Um, so one of the questions, the next question we have is, in a resource-constrained environment, i.e. clinician time, personnel, etc., how can a palliative care team effectively address needs of the child and family? For example, what resources should they draw on, strategies to use, and for psychological distress? Uh, <clears throat> that's a very good question. And, um, and my, my answer, and then I'll, I invite my colleagues to, to give their opinions on this. Um, when you have limited resources, I think the resources that you need to tap first are the internal resources within the family and then the external resources that the family may have. Uh, oftentimes, uh, if we don't ask, we don't learn about it. But uh, if we know that, for example, um, the family, um, the child has a lot of fears, um, clearly the child may have um, a, a teacher or an aunt that the child has a very good relationship with or someone that the child trusts. Uh, accessing that individual so that it can help the child communicate will be a great asset for that family and for the team. In other words, um, if you do not have the, social, the, the professional resources, you can access those resources that the child trusts. So the important thing is that you have the child communicating, that you have the family communicating, that you address their fears. As Maria was saying um, a little earlier, uh, the question as to whether or not I'm dying, is the answer, the yes or no, is not the most critical um, answer. What is critical is to address the fears. And the fears are often associated, what will happen to me? Uh, who will be with me? Uh, how would I feel? Would I have a lot of pain? Those questions that the child has uh, can be answered by a sensitive uh, adult that the child trusts. Are there any other questions for any one of us? Um, there's just a follow-up question from the, the, and sort of along the same line as the one you just um, described. Uh, is what if the child asks if they're dying and you know the parents don't want the child to know that they're dying? Um. <laughs> um, again, it's a, a, a difficult question. Um, usually, if that is the situation, uh, we will have addressed those questions with the parent. Um, we have encountered families, for example, that do not want to tell the child the name of the disease. They don't want to say that the child has cancer, for example. And initially, a short-term um, solution for communication uh, may work, but a long-term will not work. Uh, open and honest communication will always help the family. So uh, if we do know that those parents do not want to tell the child that the child is dying, we probably have a precedent in the past that those parents did not want to tell the child that he had cancer, or those parents that did not want to communicate that to the extended family, and so on and so forth. So this information will not come out of the blue. And if that's the case, you will need to address those issues with the parents first. All right, I think we've answered that one. And there is one more um, comment about the pain scale, and I think we'll leave the pain scale issue with, with this comment. And that she's saying the work of Christine Chambers has documented that the Wong Baker uh, scale confounds emotion and pain and results in differences in ratings because of this. Um, and conveniently enough, Christine was one of our presenters on our previous webinar, and it's on the Knowledge Exchange Network. It's titled Reducing Pain in Infants and Young Children During Pokes and Other Procedures. So for more information on the pain scales, again, I encourage everyone to go and uh, check out that webinar. 
Um, one other, I think one of our last two questions, uh, if the child's family members are experiencing anxiety uh, or depression due to the child's life-limiting illness, how does the impact on the child's own anxiety? How does this impact on the child's own anxiety and depression? Should families be counseled by the palliative care team along with the child? Excellent question, and I'm really glad that is uh, being put forward of extensive literature that indicates that there is a reciprocity of influences between child and parents. If a child is very anxious, the parents will become anxious. If the parents are anxious, the children will. Uh, if the child is doing well, the parents will do well. So parents do need to be advised and counseled, uh, and also they will need to be advised to address their own issues. And oftentimes, it's not an easy conversation. I, I had that conversation yesterday with one family in which the father, specifically, was extremely upset and extremely uh, anxious. And the child said, chill down, Dad. Chill down. It's OK. So um, the, the child is aware of how the father is getting highly stressed. And it impacts on the child. But this child that I just gave you as an example is an older child and felt empowered to tell the parents to chill. Other children, especially when they are a, um, a, at the end of life, may not feel empowered. And they take the cues from the parents so that if they see fear in the parents, they interpret the fear I'm dying, something is wrong, uh, something is very wrong, and they become very fearful. So it is the responsibility of the palliative care team to address those issues with the parents and advise them um, to either seek help elsewhere or um, access resources within the palliative care or within the healthcare system if they are available. Any other All right. Well, I think uh, if there's no, are there any other comments from the uh, from the team in Toronto? Thank you. No, uh, no. Thank we you. we just want to thank you for sharing uh, and for the opportunity to participate in this webinar. Oh well, I think uh, the the thanks all goes to you guys for doing such a great presentation. I mean, we're we're well over the time limit. We, we still have more than half of the participants hanging on. I've already got a bunch of emails in my inbox asking for the the link to the recording so people can hear the rest of the questions because they had to leave early. So there was definitely some 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 great interest, and in, as you can tell by the number of questions in, in this topic, as that there has been in all of our uh, pain uh, information. So thank you, uh, uh, Kim, uh, Maria, and Meru, uh, for for again for such a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thanks again, as always, to Sobia Khan and Laura Abbott for who uh, always help uh, pull all of these webinars together on on the on the pain team's end and are great to work with, uh, great partners uh, uh, in in this whole webinar process. So thanks again to you guys. And as I said, everyone will be getting an email. Everybody that registered for this webinar, as well as uh, in addition, even if they didn't show up, they will still get an email from us when this information is available on the Knowledge Exchange Network. So as always, uh, please uh, sign up for the next webinars. And uh, thanks again for coming.